our topic for the next for this evening and tomorrow is analyzing and modifying modifying canine aggressive behavior. And what I'm going to start out with, as you'll see from your agenda, is to talk a little bit, kind of give you an overview of how we view aggression, um, some important things about understanding it, <coughs> observing it, and I think to kind of lead into this to make it real clear that aggression is a really complex behavior and it's not just one behavior it's a bunch of behaviors and there's a lot that we don't know about dog aggression and why dogs display aggressive behavior in certain situations and one of the things that we often talk about when um, Nancy and I and Dan are at meetings is um, the more we know the more we know we don't know and I think that's the real mark of um, always um, expanding your view and then expanding your education it seems like that the more you learn the more you realize how much you don't know at least that's the way that it works for us so these are kind of our basic premises um, for what the um, how we're going to approach the workshop over the next couple days as I mentioned a little bit ago um, many of the cases that we see really only involve threatening behavior even though um, the people are describing their dogs as aggressive but that doesn't guarantee that these threats, whether they're low intensity threats or high intensity threats, it never guarantees that the dog is not going to escalate it to aggression at any moment in time. So we should always take threats seriously, not rationalize them. I think somewhere later in one of the presentations we talk about the mythology of the fluke theory. It was just a fluke, you know, my dog, he's never done this before, it was just a fluke, I don't think he would ever do that again. So we don't want to get into the fluke theory of, of explaining aggression. So these are very common things that have been attributed to dominance that aren't. And we're going to show a video of a case that Nancy had where this particular dog was doing most of these things, but it was not, his behavior problem was not related to dominance. And we got to get our little thing back on again here growl or threaten when they're hugged, when they're picked up. When you look at their body postures, what you see are defensive, fearful postures. You don't see the offensive, confident postures that you would expect to see of a dog in a dominant social role. It's just the opposite. I would like to see us all do is start to use some signs to examine the physiological correlation. In this case, we're not talking about cortisol. That's a whole other study, a whole more difficult area. Uh, we think the heart rate is probably a little much easier and more predictive to see can we predict how that dog's going to react to situations in the future based on what his heart does. Um, we found a correlation in the research that we're doing with not only the heart rate but the, between the variations of the beats of the heart that I'm going to explain a little bit more in a minute. Uh, we found a change in the behavior, how the dog acts. As we do therapy, we're finding that when they come back to me and I'm using the watch or just even manually taking their heart rate, that the heart rates tend to stay lower. Um, and it's helped us, uh, me anyway, evaluate the therapies that I'm doing with these dogs. And the owners now, by the way, of course, you give them something new to do, they pay way more attention. Uh, if they go, oh my God, I didn't realize how frightened he was, because that beep really is alarming. The beep starts to bother you. Beep, 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 you know, so you want to get it back down again. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how this whole system works. Again, forget everything you know about dogs, and this is human literature. Uh, what we think right now is, why are we learning how to um, do cognitive behavior therapy better and all the new therapies instead of Freudian therapy? If, if you're using a head collar, because we're talking about response prevention. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead um, and sit down if you want. Okay. <laughs> what are you doing? Yes. Yeah. Make sure that your head collar is comfortable, <clears throat> first of all, for the dog when you put it on. All of them fit quiet. about the same. Two Dan's fingers go get up here, on, make sure it's up high, you can take there. the skin, yeah. pull it up high. The second thing is make sure you can't pull it over their nose, it should only pull to the soft spot of their nose. And the third thing is try and make sure that the dog can open his mouth all the way. And that is the most common mistake that I see when clients or trainers come over with a head collar that the dog, they didn't realize, can't open his mouth and pant. And if you could picture if your mouth was held close to any extent, God forbid, and Pete are talking. Keller's very food motivated. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt <laughs> your... Oh, he says that was good. And the dog on a head collar, the other biggest things I see, and we're just going to show you a little bit of this today. Hi. 
is that I always learn this from riding a horse, one of the things good of response prevention is the animal should learn only one thing on a head collar to me is that you need to yield to pressure. That's all. There's only one thing to teach a dog is that when you hit the end of the leash, it doesn't matter if it's 500 feet long or if it's six inches long. There is only one lesson. Do not put pressure on that head collar. So what I do if they do hit it is everybody doesn't think. We're used to having leashes on their neck collars. So while we're talking to somebody, you see people doing this, and oh, he's over there, and that. And notice how much that is moving. Imagine how annoying that is on his face. So if you're riding a horse, anybody who's ever ridden, the number one thing they teach you is you can't have the reins to you can hold both hands with glasses of water, rider, with glasses of water, so that when you move your hands on the rein, you are communicating to your partner, and this is your partner. So if your hands are moving everywhere, he cannot predict where you want him to go or what you want him to do. This case is the one where they had called in a bunch of trainers and there were chains thrown and yelling and jerking and pulling and, all, and cookies. And then, you know, they mix them up. The, we throw the chains, then we give the cookies. Um, so what we did with this dog was she was aggressive to everything. And, and when I look at a case, yes, the dog was attacking the glass and that's all she did, but that was only the tip of the iceberg that any trainer addressed. Here's what she did all day, I found out when the owners were at work. You, have to, you just learn to ask questions. Well, when she's home alone, is she loose in the house? And they go, yeah. And I go, well, is she down here attacking people at the windows and dogs all day? Because that's what she does when you're home. And she said, oh, no, she's upstairs in the bedroom all day. Big red flag. This dog is so fearful and anxious and frightened when the owners aren't home. She's up in the bed like this, terrified. The only time she attacks anybody is when the owners come home.